Good evening, everyone. So I'm afraid it's time to start. Um, so first of all, welcome at the Graduate Institute. Uh, my name is Lore van der Wallen. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Economics and an affiliate of uh, the Gender Center here at the Institute. So today is actually the, the first day of the new academic year, so which explains the large number of young, excited people in the corridors of the Maison de la Paix. This will definitely change in the coming week when they start getting homeworks. So, but as such, this event is actually uh, the first one of a large number of events that will be organized throughout the year and to which you're obviously highly welcome. So I'm very pleased tonight to welcome our partners from the World Bank and Women at the Table, with whom we are jointly organizing uh, today's public lecture, Women, Business and the Law 2018, which is the fifth edition of the report that measures legal obstacles to women who engage in economic activity around uh, the world. So the way this evening uh, will, will go along, so first we have a presentation, after which we have a panel, and then finally there will be a Q&A with the public. But so let me first of all invite Tanya Primiani, who is a Senior Investment Policy Officer for the Trade and Competitiveness Global Practice at the World Bank Group in Washington, D.C. And very important, she's a co-author actually of the report, so we couldn't find anyone better to actually present us the main results or the key findings of the, of the report. So, Ms. Primiani, thank you very much for being with us this evening. The floor is uh, entirely yours. All right. So I don't need to do anything except fast forward. This is great. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers for allowing us to come here and present this report. And obviously, thank you to the Institute for hosting. This is really a wonderful venue, and we're really excited to be here today and to tell you more about this, um, this report that we launched in March uh, earlier this year. So um, some of you might be familiar with the report. It's called Women, Business, and the Law. It started about 10 years ago at the World Bank Group. The bank was already doing a lot of work on um, how difficult or easy it was to start businesses around the world. And around that time, we started asking ourselves, um, how does this impact women as well? We know that in some countries, businesses are harder to start and operate, but are, are there any specific restrictions that apply to women? And when we started digging deeper on that question, we realized that yes, there were actually a lot of restrictions that made it difficult for women to either enter the workforce or become entrepreneurs. And that's really the genesis of this report. That's how it started. And we started our first publication in 2020, 2010, sorry. And since then, we've published five uh, editions of the report. We publish it biannually, and the data is always made available on the website. And like I said, the last launch was earlier this year in March. We've expanded our range of countries, so now we actually cover 189 economies around the world, and we cover a wide range of topics, and I will get into that uh, shortly. But I wanted to say that the, the, the purpose of the report, like I mentioned, is really to shine a light on the legislation, the regulations, that either help or hinder women's participation in the workforce and uh, becoming entrepreneurs, and also laws that help women, uh, that, that really help them uh, become part of the workforce. And what we found is that by measuring things across time, we're really able to track progress. And uh, as anybody here who's uh, worked with, with countries and scores and rankings before, you will know that a little bit of friendly competition really goes a long way when you're trying to get people, or in this case countries, to change their ways. And we found this to be the case with the report that I mentioned earlier, the Doing Business Report, but also with Women, Business and the Law that has really fostered a lot of uh, desiring countries to change and, uh, and reform. So like I said, we measure a, ride, a, a wide range of uh, different areas. We have seven different buckets, uh, which are we call, uh, we call them indicators, in which we have an, a large number of different questions that we ask our contributors. Our contributors tend to be lawyers or people from uh, the legal field, civil society organization, and all these countries that we, that we collect data in. And um, we look at areas of legal capacity, agency, freedom of movement under the accessing institutions umbrella, under getting a job, we look at um, areas of restrictions to employment, uh, leave policies, 
providing incentive to work covers the area of child care, under protecting women from violence, um, obviously we, we cover uh, gender-based violence, we look at areas of domestic violence and sexual, uh, sexual harassment, using property looks at areas of access to, uh, to property, property rights, going to court looks at the ease of accessing the legal system, and finally building credit looks at areas of uh, accessing credit for women. What was interesting and new in this latest report uh, that we published in March was that we introduced a scoring. Previously, we would just publish our results as almost like a Q&A where we had a lot of these questions that were provided uh, on our website and we had answers to all these questions for the countries around the world. What we did last year was to, to add a dimension of scoring which really allows people, users, uh, stakeholders, country you know, policymakers to take a look at our report and at a glance really understand what we're trying to say. And we found that to be a very powerful tool in order to encourage countries to better look at the areas in which they're not scoring so well to see where they can improve. Um, the fundamental idea behind this project is that really um, gender equality is not only the right thing to do, which I think we can all agree upon in this room, but it's really the smart thing to do. And the reason we do this is that at the World Bank, we're really focusing on, on making the economic argument for why this is important. And we find that there's a lot of literature out there that really backs us up. So I think some of you may be familiar with this report. It was quoted extensively, but McKinsey put something out in 2015 that really showed that basically if we reach gender uh, equality by 2025, we would be adding $28 trillion to the global economy. That's, that's massive. And that's also an argument that resonates really well with policymakers when you try to talk to them about gender equality. Sometimes it's a little bit hard because you, en you enter a little bit of a, a, you know, sensitive areas. But I think when you frame it in uh, the economic viewpoint, it can sometimes make those arguments easier. This being said, um, the way that we measure things is not completely separated from the human rights uh, framework. It's actually very much interconnected and, and very often they're two sides of the same coin. So we're very, very much based on the efforts and the work that CEDA has been doing on, on gender rights. <coughs> Pardon me. And very often the questions that we have in our, in our surveys are directly coming from some of the, some of the protections that are uh, presented in CEDA, whether it comes to um, family life, economic freedom, um, you know, uh, access to credit. A lot of these are really combined with the work that other human rights organizations are doing. We're just looking at it from the economic perspective. And now quickly, just to give you a sense of some of the research, uh, some of the data that has come out of our latest report, um, our, our, our data on getting a job, for example, shows us that 104 economies around the world still have some kind of restriction on women getting a job. This could take a lot of different forms. It could be a restriction on specific industries. So we see that in mining and the water sector, um, there, there are oftentimes specific restrictions that make it difficult or impossible for women to operate. But there are also smaller restrictions like um, specific restrictions on the types of tasks that they can do or restrictions on night work, for example, that make it more difficult for women to enter the workforce. And what's interesting is that often these restrictions can actually keep women out of certain sectors of ec the economy that are the most lucrative. This is the case in mining, for example, where you find some of these high paying jobs, especially in um, the, lower, um, the lower income countries. So it is, it is quite important for women to have access to those jobs. We were just talking about this earlier, but a lot of these provisions are actually legacies from a colonial era. And so in a lot of countries that had a colonial past, these legislations are still in place and they were set up as a measure of protection, but since then, um, these, uh, these safety standards have now changed and they're now outdated, but they're still being preserved in the law. And we see this, for example, in the case of a lot of the former Soviet states that still have in place um, Soviet era laws from the 1930s that really prevent women from entering a lot of different uh, jobs and, and industries. For example, the, the case of Russia, where up until our last report, the country still had 456 specific restrictions on the types of jobs that women can do. So these, um, these restrictions really impact women's ability to enter the workforce on the same playing field as their male counterparts. And this is important because our research shows that gender equality in labor law, as measured by our, uh, our indicator, is correlated both with um, f higher female 
female labor force participation rate and uh, a larger, um, a, sorry, a lower wage gap. So this is really important also in terms of the economic perspective um, for, for development. Our report also shows that a third of the economies still restrict women's freedom of movement or agency. And what we mean by this is um, we look at a lot of different questions in terms of what women can do in the same way or, is differently, or differently from men. Uh, we look at a woman's ability to apply for a passport or an ID. We look at the ability to travel outside the house or outside the country. We look at a woman's ability to get a job without her husband's permission or register a business without her husband's permission, get a bank account. All these things that make a woman's employment and entrepreneurship easier. And we find that in a large number of countries, there are still outright restrictions or at, uh, um, sometimes there are also um, l lower or, or lesser discriminations, but that still make it harder for women to do some of these actions. For example, they have to uh, provide additional paperwork or they have, to, they have to get someone to sign a document for them. All these things, all these little hurdles just add up and they make things, um, they make this harder, things harder for women. Our report shows that in 18 economies around the world, and these are um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Middle East and North Africa, there are still restrictions on uh, women getting a job. And so in some cases, a woman needs her husband's outright permission. In some other cases, the husband can prevent her from working or can um, make it difficult for her to, to do this job. And so obviously, this is um, very important because when um, it is difficult for women to accomplish all these different little tasks, we also find there's a correlation with the number of women that are um, in, in elected positions in, in national parliament in position of leadership. And we know that this is important for um, outcomes, positive outcomes for women. Moving forward on the area of gender-based violence, I mentioned that we capture this as well. We found a really important data point that shows that 59 of the economies that we cover still do not legally prohibit um, sexual harassment at work. And this is really important because our analysis also shows that there's a high correlation between having uh, sexual harassment legislation and employment and um, having a large number of firms with female ownership. So there is, um, there is that correlation. There's also obvious correlations, uh, uh, the obvious um, case for just not having sexual harassment at work, which you know speaks for itself. But we also, like I said, like to make the case on the economic outcomes so that we can have a stronger foot to stand on. And like I mentioned earlier, this year we introduced scoring for the first time. And what was really interesting with scoring is that it allowed us to, prevent, uh, to present the data and to give a snapshot of what, what, what was happening. And so one thing that we did was also try to compare regions to each other uh, and to see how countries fared in comparison to each other. And one thing that we found is that um, the region overall that tended to perform the best uh, on average was OECD high income countries, perhaps unsurprisingly. But what was also interesting is that really there was no region in which countries scored 100 across the board. So while we did have countries that scored 100 on some of these indicators, not a single country scored 100 everywhere, which really means that even amongst our best performers, there are still a lot of things that they can do to, to improve. Um, we also saw a lot of really positive trends, a lot of really positive changes um, among the 189 economies that we captured 80, uh, 65 had reformed over the course of the past two years. We captured 87 reforms total. And what was really interesting about this analysis as well is that it's not only the high performers, the top performers, the high, high income OECD countries that are changing. You have a lot of really, really positive examples coming out of conflict and fragile countries. You have a lot of really positive examples coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa. As a matter of fact, some of our top performers this year um, were in Africa. We had Kenya, we had Tanzania, we had the DRC, and we also had, <coughs> excuse me, we also had conflict um, economies like Iraq and Afghanistan that came out as some of our <coughs> top performers. The area in which we saw the most movement was the area of uh, getting a job, so the area of labor law. And we saw a lot, of, um, a lot of trends, a lot of changes in the positive direction here. What we have in this slide is uh, snapshots from the local papers highlighting changes in labor laws, some on, on maternity leave, paternity leave, pensions, uh, the types of uh, working condition. So this is really an area these days where we're seeing a lot of very positive changes. 
And then again, another little statistics from a report, the, the area, the, the region which had the most reformers within it, within it, so as a percentage of the total number of countries in that region, was South Asia, where 50% of the, of the uh, countries in that region actually had some kind of positive reform. And then um, I would be remiss, especially since we're here in Geneva, to, to not mention the work that we're doing on uh, uh, SDG indicator 511. So the, the World Bank Group and basically Women, Business, and the Law, the report that we're working on, is a co-custodian um, alongside UN Women and the OECD for this indicator, measuring basically whether or not the legal frameworks promote equality between men and women. And it's really using a lot of our data, um, almost word for word, it's feeding into this indicator. And it's been a really interesting experience for us being, um, being part of this, um, being part of this work and also jointly working with our colleagues at UN Women and the OECD to try to move this indicator forward. And so it's, it's positive to see that our work, you know, for women business and the law is helping with World Bank operations, helping um, teams incorporate the gender lens in their operational work, but it's also feeding into more broad efforts like this SDG effort, which we're very proud of. Um, and I'll just close off by repeating that all, everything I mentioned today is on our website. The report is fully downloadable on the website as well. You can also uh, filter by country, by topic, whatever is, is most interesting to you. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end if you have any. Thank you. So I'm sure that all of you already have a lot of questions to ask, but uh, before that, I make sure that you even get more questions to ask. So we'll first have, uh, have the panel. So I'll start with Isabelle Durand, who is the furthest away from me. She, so she's the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, so the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development here in Geneva, Geneva and that's since uh, 2017. Previously, she, was, uh, she served as the Deputy Prime Minister in the Belgian government and a member of the European Parliament, where she also served as Vice President. So next, we have uh, Ambassador Khan. She's a Fiji's permanent representative to the United Nations and to the World Trade Organization in Geneva. In 1999, so I'm going back a bit in time, she was the first woman ever, actually, to be, uh, to be appointed the High Court Judge in the Fijis. So she's also a member of the Advisory Council for the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice on the International Criminal Court, and she serves as a trustee for several NGOs that focus on women and on youth. Then Caitlin kraft Butchman is the CEO and the founder of Women at the Table, which is a Geneva-based organization which makes gender visible on the global stage, and we women leaders a point of reference in conversations that extend past the women's issues into the larger debate on economy, on governance, technology, sustainability, and sport. So these are actually the five strategic pillars of Women at the Table's work. She's also one of the co-founders of International Gender Champions, a leadership network of female and male decision makers that breaks down gender barriers for a system of change. So, and last but not least, I probably should start with uh, apologizing for the gender discrimination that is taking place on the stage this evening. So, finally, we have uh, Martin Chungong, who is the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, the IPU. So, after 14 years of uh, working in the Cameroonian Parliament, he spent actually already more than 20 years within IPU before finally being elected as its uh, Secretary General. So he leads IPU's work to dramatically reduce maternal and child mortality rates through effective legislation and its implementation, as well ensuring government's accountability to international commitments within this area. So to all of you, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Based just on the different experiences, uh, I'm sure this will be a very interesting, uh, interesting debate. 
So the first set of questions are actually related to, to the many constraints that, that are there with respect to women uh, empowerment. So there are institutional constraints, there are legal constraints, there are cultural constraints. And given that all of you have a very different background, I first actually would like to ask some questions related to the roles of parliaments, of legislations, of international institutions in reducing uh, these barriers. So maybe let me start with, uh, with Ambassador Khan. So, so how can governments, so you've been working close to the government, you have a lot of experience with, re with respect to uh, legal issues. So how can governments guarantee gender equality in legislation to allow women to fulfill their potential? I think an important first step uh, is a constitutional and legal framework. And so a guarantee of gender equality um, in relation to employment, but also in relation to all other spheres is really very important because uh, this is the guarantee that is enforceable in the courts. And ultimately we know that many, many women use the courts uh, to enforce rights and made significant changes in the way that the jurisprudence uh, develops. But this uh, constitutional and legal guarantee really must reflect the intersectional nature of discrimination. Uh, discrimination really um, shows itself in many practices and often cannot be uh, simply uh, identified as, as being gender discrimination, uh, racial discrimination, uh, discrimination on the grounds of disability, these all different ways in which uh, discrimination actually uh, unfolds itself. Um, in, 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 in employment practices. But then, having uh, passed a legal and constitutional framework, uh, and even without a constitutional framework, because many significant economies do not have a constitutional bill of rights, um, it's really important that these rights be enforceable. And enforceable in a way which reflects the significant changes in uh, international human rights law. So, for instance, the Indian Supreme Court on sexual harassment, this was very, very significant. The Canadian um, Constitutional Court has made significant um, changes to the law on gender equality and employment. And really, the ability to use all of this amazing international jurisprudence is something that should be available to every judiciary. So judges really should be trained on how to use it. And then uh, very important that uh, the way that the laws are interpreted in a jurisdiction must now stop reflecting this protective ideology, this idea that women need to be protected. Um, and therefore, this justifies restrictions in employment practices. This is uh, no longer acceptable. It is a form of discrimination against women. Um, but it still persists, which is, uh, which is a concern. Um, and uh, this is all about uh, the, uh, the legal discussion around whether um, differential treatment in the courts uh, is treatment which is based on historical his disadvantage or whether it's based on the fact that men and women are different and so therefore they can't do the same jobs, which is of course a most destructive uh, ideology. So I think uh, really the way this ideology has developed, and you can see from the European court decisions uh, how the court has slightly shifted its position, not as far as I would have liked the court to shift on this issue, but certainly it has shifted and started now to talk about uh, disadvantage and historical disadvantage. So I think that's uh, a really important space for judges, the ability for judges to use jurisprudence from around the world uh, in an enlightened way. And then, of course, one of the greatest barriers, and that is the attitudes uh, of society and, and the greatest difficulty in changing that. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chungong. So if you take a look at uh, the global average of female representation in Parliament, we see that it's actually only 23 percent, which is already an improvement with, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, but still. So how actually can the IPU assist parliaments in addressing the existing imbalances and actually create opportunities that increase women's role in society? Thank you very much, uh, Alor. Uh, yes, it's about 23%. I, I would say it's slightly above 23%. It's 23.4%. <laughs> he says and, to the economist. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I, I think that this is uh, uh, some progress, it's substantial progress. If you remember that some 20 years ago it was just 11%. So women's representation in parliament has more than doubled in just 20 years. But 
what we have seen is that this pace is slowing, slowing down, and uh, if something is not done to prosecute uh, gender equality in politics, um, it's going to take us maybe 50 years to uh, start thinking of gender uh, parity in, in politics. So it is important that we rededicate ourselves to promoting uh, gender equality. And I would say it has become uh, the light motive of the IPU's work over the years, and uh, I'm always pleased to be able to showcase some of the uh, things that we are doing. Uh, I must say, and you pointed out uh, at the beginning, that uh, uh, I accepted to join this uh, panel in spite of the fact that it was not gender equal, because, <laughs> because I thought that uh, it would be important uh, uh, for us to showcase what women can bring to the table. Uh, because uh, we recognize the fact that uh, the uh, playing field is not level. I also see uh, that uh, the World Bank report, uh, uh, some of the indicators have to do with access to institutions and uh, uh, protecting women against violence, something that we need to address at the parliamentary level if we want to make sure that uh, women have equitable access to governing institutions. And, uh, you asked me what we can do to do. I think it's very simple. First of all, uh, there is advocacy. We need to continue to create awareness of the importance of the gender equality in political life. It makes sense. It uh, confers legitimacy on governing institutions. It's important. It's a matter of uh, human rights. Uh, there's no reason why uh, a human being should be excluded from uh, 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 part, taking part in the way society is managed. I uh, think it makes sense. And uh, if we look at the SDGs in general, I think it's important if we want to begin to hope to uh, implement, uh, achieve the SDGs by 2030, that we must uh, actively uh, promote uh, gender equality. And uh, simple things like uh, special measures, uh, quotas, for instance, uh, have proven uh, their worth uh, instituting these special measures allows for a uh, substantial increase in uh, uh, women's political representation. We have seen from studies that uh, where quotas have been implemented, uh, Parliament generally has some sort of, uh, about 30 percent of uh, uh, women in, in the institution, whereas with no quotas, the average is about 15. So uh, it makes the point for uh, the special measure, and we say special temporary measures, because we recognize the fact that uh, there is an imbalance now, and you need to level the playing field for women to hope to play a critical role in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, governance. And other special measures, such as reserve seats for uh, women in parliament, as many countries, you have this. And then there's also the uh, helping parliaments to uh, institute electoral systems that uh, are conducive to women's representation. And we've seen that uh, proportional representation systems are more likely to produce better outcomes than the uh, first past the post system. So we do encourage that uh, uh, in uh, the work that we do with, with parliaments. And uh, you countries that are undergoing transition are those that uh, are most likely to be uh, uh, agreeable to these measures. For instance, it was not difficult for us to institute these measures in Tunisia, following the Arab Spring in Egypt, and uh, uh, what other country I had on my list here. Benin now is working on uh, putting in place a quota system to increase women's uh, representation. So we think that uh, a combination of a number of things, you know, working with uh, uh, parliaments to create this awareness and building capacity uh, can produce results. Building capacity is important because uh, it is not enough just to have women in parliament. They're not there for window dressing. They're there to create an impact, to influence decisions and outcomes in parliament. And so parliaments have to be gender sensitive in the way they operate. It should be an environment, parliament should be an environment, working environment like any other one that is free of hassle, that is, uh, it takes care of uh, the special needs of women to make sure that uh, they can participate uh, equitably in uh, uh, decision-making processes in parliament. And that is why we advocate for uh, women holding leadership positions in parliament to make sure that they can begin to make an impact on the way uh, uh, this uh, uh, parliament's uh, function. We've also seen that uh, gender caucuses, for instance, are also effective in federating women. 
to make impact an impact on the way decisions are made in Parliament, and so we're supporting this. At the level of the institution that I represent, we're also trying to walk the talk, and I think, uh, Caitlin, we're going, we're about to publish uh, this uh, toolkit for uh, uh, international organizations on uh, how they can make their assemblies uh, gender sensitive. I think I've just given my green light today for, to that uh, toolkit. And there, we want to make sure that uh, the institutions of governance in our various uh, organizations are gender sensitive, be they the assemblies or the governing bodies. So, and for the IPU, we have a system of naming and shaming. We have a system of, as uh, um, uh, Tanya was saying, uh, friendly competition. There is a, a spirit of emulation. The countries are always uh, pleased to be able to graduate from gender in unequal parliaments to uh, gender equitable parliaments. I know that uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, when they decided to have women in parliament, the ambassador here was quick to call me to say, you see, we've done it. So they, it can be done. And if in the IPU you come with single sex delegations, you are penalized, you lose part of your voting rights. This is statutory and uh, you have to combine cajoling of uh, the carrot with the stick. Now, if you perform well, you receive the rewards. If you don't perform well, then uh, you face the wrath of the uh, uh, institution. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. So from the national level to the international level. So Ms. Doron, how has UNCTAD incorporated gender considerations into its trade and investment policies to actually ensure that uh, gender-related constraints do not impede inclusive development? Okay, well, thank you for the question, because uh, it's true that uh, the law can change a lot of things, the constitution and the jurisprudence, so it was explained, the law can change the parity or better representation of women in parliament, but what about trade and trade for development? Well, trade is perceived uh, everywhere as neutral. There was no impact on uh, women or on gender. It's not true, of course. Trade could be an important tool to promote uh, better gender sensitivity and uh, a, a, a big presence of women in the economic uh, fields. Uh, for example, when you speak about uh, gender and trade on gender and economic aspect, it's always speaking on microcredit for women, uh, microcredit, micro project in order to survive. It's only that. When you speak about how could women uh, be entrepreneur, become entrepreneur, uh, be part of the network of the Chamber of Commerce in all the structure where economic things are decided and where they could promote uh, their own activity, it's of course more difficult. And in UNCTAD, we worked a lot regarding uh, some indicator and tools in order to, first of all, to, 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 uh, to make the people more aware that, well, there was, that's not neutral, how could you work in the free trade agreement in order to influence the gender sensitivity through the, for example, the, the free trade agreement, international trade, not only local trade, and uh, uh, also to, to, to put uh, rules or new rules uh, in the all the, the trade aspect. Uh, I would also look at the, what you said in the beginning was the different indicator, because when you make some uh, review or law review, you can identify that uh, if women don't have access to uh, credit, to banking account, to uh, ownership on the land, how could you develop an, an activity without these basic tools? So sometimes, when uh, even if you have some laws, you have also, and, and even when ownership uh, of land is possible, it's the case in Ethiopia, and I was a bit surprised because it's the case. Uh, recently, a law uh, gave the possibility for women to to heritage and have access to own, uh, uh, ownership of land, but uh, culturally, the law is not implemented. And um, in many villages, uh, it's impossible for her woman, even the law gives her access to ownership uh, of land. Culturally, it's difficult for her and for her, even for a man to give the heritage to women. So at the time before the law and the implementation of the law is very long, and so it's why we have also to look not only the law, but the way of the implementation of the law. Because sometimes it means that a woman has to claim, uh, to introduce a claim in order to have access to justice and to change the things for her. But for in some countries, some region, or especially in developing countries and in some 
rural areas, it's really difficult for a woman to introduce a claim uh, because it means that she will be mm, not exclude, but perceive uh, towards uh, the community uh, very, it, it will open a different, a difficult period for her. So uh, that's why we are working with countries, not only with the law, but also the way to implement the law and to change a chamber of commerce network between different women in order to develop their own capacity. And I give you another example. We have a program called Empretec, which is a, a program for uh, stimulate entrepreneurship, not only for women, but especially for women. And uh, some women explain uh, to us, for example, in Uganda, uh, a woman uh, uh, who was uh, um, refugee and then uh, sexually abused, etc. So she was really uh, uh, in a very bad situation. And she said, yes, some men try to, to, to keep my dignity, but Empretec, with the program of Empretec, I was removed my dignity because she became an entrepreneur and you know she had a lot of uh, activities after the, this difficult situation. And I think that this program of Empretec is very specific, but it's not only a how could you make a business plan, etc. It's dedicated to self-confidence. How could you network? How to, could you find yourself, your self-confidence in order to, well, to fight against all the different constraints, not only the law, uh, the legal constraint, but also the cultural and all the, this aspect. And last thing, we are working inside Hungtat in order to, to, that in all our reports, in all our activity, the gender aspect is developed in all the play. When we speak about that, uh, we make a report on inequalities. There is a specific aspect on gender. When we are doing on robotization, digitalization, uh, relationship between uh, 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 the, the, with uh, uh, technology, uh, we have always a chapter and a uh, mainstream regarding gender. And I think that gender could not be a small chapter. It has to be mainstream in all the activities regarding trade and economic development, if we want, that at the end, women could participate. So you explain that the, the figure of 20 to 28 uh, trillion. So if we want to, the, to give the, uh, uh, the woman the opportunity to really participate to the development of their country, we have also to mainstream gender aspect in all the production, all the, pro all the reports, all the activities, and of course, uh, also in the technological aspect, which sometimes for women, technology is a little bit far uh, uh, from them for some different reasons. So the, the capacity building, skills, uh, awareness, and rules, and at the end, laws. But I think that all the 11 have to be fulfilled if we want to have a, a result. Thank you very much. So, Caitlin, you're not uh, getting the... Well, you get a very difficult task because after hearing all these different points, the question I had for you is actually what, from the point of view then of uh, women at the table, what's, what are the points or what are the aspects that actually you think are most important in giving women a stronger influence at decision-making tables? So whether that's in the sphere of trade or investments, economics, technology, so how can you actually make the, the position of women stronger in decision making? Well, thanks. Uh, well, so women at the table does policy amplification on a legal gender equality, which we've just heard about, which everybody does here. Um, but we also focus on a very critical piece, which is policy implementation, which is the how to the policies what, right? And so if you have treaties like CEDAW, which are the why, and you have policies that are the what, the implementation is the how. And we're very much focused, especially here in Geneva, on that. We're no longer talking about the why or the what, but really how, how do we do it? Because that's what's really tripping people up. Um, and I must mention, because it has sort of been hinted at all the way through here, is first of all, UNCTAD is, of course, your um, SG's first year commitment to international gender champions was to mainstream have gender mainstreamed in every policy document that UNCTAD does. So we're really, really proud of that. Um, we're very proud of this toolkit that will be um, launched next week at, at UNGA, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, that's a gen, uh, gender responsive toolkit about how do you make assemblies really from the conception to the execution, how do you make them gender responsive so women's voices are not only heard, but they have influence. And also the trade, I see two um, 
great leaders here from Iceland and also Ambassador Stevens, lately of Sierra Leone, who are the great leaders in driving the trade declaration at the WTO, uh, which came out of the gender champions and it sort of a, started a whole groundswell there in that building about women's economic empowerment. Lest people here think that a lot of gender equality issues are, are they're passe or they've already been dealt with and why are we dealing with these and not other issues, um, I would posit that gender is kind of a stealth act for reinvigorating liberal democracies. That if we can get it right for the 50, 52% of the population that's been left out of the power sharing, we're gonna be able to be inclusive enough and bring the rest of the people in and sort of make um, democracies responsive in a way that really makes sense. What I'm really interested in, in this World Bank report, which is an extraordinary collection of data. It's just an amazing, amazing report. Um, you talk about three categories of uh, laws, and they're also very interesting to me because I think they go in that same sort of three dimensions that uh, we've been talking about at Gender Champions and Women at the Table. And the first is the laws that actually actively exclude women. They're biased, they're what you would expect, they just don't let women participate at all. But that's just the beginning. Then there are the laws that, they're not even neutral, I would call them a negative space. They don't hinder women, but they just are, we used to call it neutral, and now it's really just they don't help, it's sort of like zero gravity, and that's, a lot of what we found in the trade world, where the trade is thought to be uh, gender neutral, but it really disadvantages women. And then the third set of categories that, that this report delves into um, quite interestingly, talk about laws that proactively help women. And, uh, and these really come in the form of gender commissions, um, where anti-discrimination commissions, um, but we even see stuff we're starting to see uh, some of that manifest itself even in the gender subcommission in Colombia during the peace treaty going on. When, we, when there are these gender commissions that allow space for women to express themselves, articulate, have influence, make impact, it sort of changes the dimensions of, uh, and the quality of the conversation. So we, we really love that. Um, this maps to work that's also being done at Stanford in a different way that's more sociology, which talks about the three steps towards when we want to talk about what gender, how do we achieve gender equality, finally. And the first is, you know, fix, fix the numbers of women, right? And that's where everybody started. It's very 80s, everybody agrees, women are 50% of the population, they should have a place um, on the stage. But that's only the first bit because it also presupposes that once you have numbers of women, that the women are gonna fix things. But of course they're not. You need male champions and you need, you need feminists, right? And not all, all women are feminists, so nor should we expect them, sadly, expect them to be. Um, the second dimension of that is to fix the institutions. That the institutions themselves are inhospitable to women, the way that they, uh, working hours, the way that tenures, um, is only um, achieved during the time when a woman's child, at her greatest height of childbearing. I mean, they're all, the institutions themselves, the mechanisms, are inhospitable to women in particular, but really, I would posit, or any other. Um, the inst it doesn't work. That's num so that's step number two, according to Stanford. And step number three is really to fix the knowledge. And that presupposes the way that we budget, the way that we do research, the way that we make research priorities and we grant research, um, that we do the way we do gender budgeting, fair taxation, um, uh, and the data that we collect and the questions we ask. So, in conclusion to my little bit, I want to say that in terms of the data we collect. One of the things that um, I think that we're all interested in as a group, and I invite everybody to participate in this this coming year, I think that we need to thread the needle, the necklace, make, take all the extraordinary pearls, um, especially here in Geneva, and take CEDAW and connect it, as you have, to the World 
Bank's report and connect that to the TPR at the World Trade Organization and then connect it back to the UPR um, at the Human Rights Council and then connect that back to CEDAW because all these questions are being asked in very, very sophisticated ways in all these different fora, but they're not connected up at all so that we're not, I don't think, gaining the kind of momentum that we could and we should if we all just focus in that way. So, there, here you go. Thank you very much for that. So I have a second set of questions, which more relate to your own experience, because you all have a very long career already with, uh, with a lot of experiences that have been built up. So let me this time start with uh, Mr. Chungong. So your career experience is three decades. So that's quite a bit, and that's purely on, on knowledge with respect to parliaments at both the national and the international levels. So in your experience, how can one ensure that parliaments commit to breaking down gender barriers? Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Laura. I, I, I think that uh, the uh, title of the report that is being launched today says it all. It says uh, women, business and the law. And when you talk of the law, you're talking of uh, parliaments. In fact, in most political jurisdictions, Parliament is a central pillar to the legislative process. It shares this responsibility with uh, uh, the head of state or prime minister. And uh, when it comes to oversight and accountability, it is parliaments that have the formal uh, function to oversee government, whatever government is doing to ensure that accountability. So it seems to us that when we're talking about uh, gender equality and looking at how uh, governments can be held account to account for commitments entered into internationally. We're looking to parliaments and strengthening their capacity to do this. And you need, first of all, leadership. You need uh, some champions, and these champions have to be higher up in the leadership ranks of parliament, the speaker, the chairs of committees. They have to be committed to gender equality, otherwise nothing will happen. And so our first part of call is to make sure that you have that commitment at that level and make sure that the commitment is ongoing and is not uh, something that is moment momentary. And then you look at uh, how you can help parliaments, and that is what we have been doing uh, for this several, for the past 40 years. You look at parliaments and see how you can help them improve upon laws, existing laws, to eliminate discriminatory provisions in the laws that exist. And also to ensure that new laws are not discriminatory. I think it's important. Uh, and uh, this brings us to uh, gender mainstreaming, which means that uh, any law that is passed or scrutinized by parliament should be scrutinized uh, uh, using a gender lens to make sure that uh, the, the law in question addresses the uh, uh, differential needs of men and women in an unequitable uh, uh, fashion. Uh, we can show some examples, for instance, when we were helping the Mali parliament address the issue of female genital mutilation. Um, we had to uh, get them to reach out to some constituencies, for instance, the religious and traditional leaders of the country. You know, they wield a lot of power and you need to convince them. So uh, you have to start there, uh, prepare the ground. Same thing in Burkina Faso, where uh, female genital mutilation is firmly entrenched. And once you begin to uh, uh, convince these people and get them on your side, then the process of legislation and implementing legislation becomes easy. So it is something that you have to do. You have to help parliaments, that you don't have to help them in a vacuum. You have to help them reach out to uh, constituents. Another thing that uh, we have found very useful is, uh, again, emulation. Uh, uh, as we speak, I think tomorrow we are launching a seminar for Arab states on gender equality in the context of the SDGs. This is, uh, I believe, a very uh, useful platform for exchanging experiences and good practice. Uh, there's lots of good practice out there that we need to share with uh, the people who are in need of uh, uh, these tools. So uh, we organize many such uh, seminars at regional but also at the uh, national uh, levels. It is important also that together with 
uh, parliaments and the leaders of parliaments will identify areas for reform uh, because uh, in many jurisdictions uh, there's need for reform uh, since we know that the imbalance, gender imbalance is still uh, a major uh, cause of concern in many uh, jurisdictions. So we identify that and uh, as I mentioned in my uh, previous statement, uh, you need to identify the champions, you need to bring women together because uh, they know where the shoe pinches. So many issues that uh, uh, impact on the lives of the women can be driven by women themselves. But again, I am keen to state that we don't have to lock women in a ghetto. Gender is not just a women's issue. It has to involve the men. And there are lots of good uh, examples out there where men are members of uh, women's caucuses, so in spite of their uh, sex, they, they uh, espouse uh, the values that are prom uh, promoted within these caucuses. And so we encourage this type of uh, alliance and uh, coalitions. I mentioned uh, the issue of uh, uh, outreach, but let me just uh, conclude with uh, the example of CEDAW. CEDA is uh, an international instrument that has been uh, signed and ratified by almost every state in the world. It is binding on countries, and it is up to parliaments to ensure compliance by governments with the uh, provisions of CEDA. And we do help uh, parliaments do that for in the context of uh, the CEDA review of country reports. Uh, every day I do sign letters to speakers of parliaments telling them that their country is cut up for review uh, in the CEDAW committee, and they have to make sure that the reports coming out of, the, of the, it, their countries are reviewed and scrutinized by parliament, and that when the uh, recommendations from the review come back home, they are aware and uh, push government to implement them fully. And I'm pleased to say that uh, increasingly you have members of parliament attending uh, their country's uh, process, uh, reviews uh, and going back home with a lot of information on what to do. And uh, uh, every year, uh, every, uh, every year we do organize an annual session for on the implementation of CEDAW for key members of parliament and we'll have one such seminar in October so that it is always on the radar screen of uh, parliament wherever they are given the universality of the nature of the, of the, of the, of the CEDAW convention. So uh, one last point that I wanted to make was that, yes, political empowerment is important. It's very important. But if you don't address economic and financial empowerment of women, if you don't look at those imp financial impediments, if, uh, economic impediments to women's political participation, whatever we are doing to promote this will only yield mitigated effects and impacts. So uh, I think that we need a combination of uh, political empowerment and economic and financial uh, inclusion for women to begin to make an impact. And concluding, therefore, I say for the IPU, again, we go back to this combination of measures. You have cajoling, you have uh, praising, but you also have naming and shaming, uh, promoting peer pressure. There's nothing like peer pressure. It's not like the Secretary General of the IPU coming to impose on a country what they're doing. I simply tell them that next door they're doing well. This parliament is doing well, and why can't you do well too? So I think that uh, uh, it goes very well. But then again, we have to be realistic that some countries may have all the commitment, they may have all the goodwill, the parliaments, but do not have the knowledge and skills and the know-how to implement the changes that are required. And that is where the IPU and other partners uh, women at the table can forge an alliance in support of these uh, uh, legislative institutions that are key to change in society. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ambassador Khan, um, your experience is mainly as a lawyer and a judge of the High Court of the Fiji. So, what do you think are the most critical aspects that countries like the Fiji should actually focus on to empower women? I think in many developing countries, uh, people assume that uh, when the law declares a right to equality, that in fact there is equality. 
uh, but it's not a law, but the effect of a law on the lives of women that is, I think, one of the biggest challenges. When I first started uh, at law school, there were only four women in my, in my year. And uh, now I think the majority of, of graduates at law school are, are women, which is very, very positive. It makes us all excited. But where are all the women judges and the women partners in, in law firms? So somehow um, the uh, employment practices of the legal profession are in fact getting rid of women before they are able to really discover their potential. And that's when we really go into those issues which are uh, set out in the report. Issues of domestic violence and sexual harassment. And, and even, I think, more insidious is how are people actually uh, promoted uh, in a law firm? How much of this is going on in the golf course, uh, in clubs? Um, how much of it is, is a gossip uh, kind of process where uh, people are headhunted and there isn't a fair recruitment process where women can actually show that they are merito meritorious? And then, of course, the difficulties with childcare. How many people leave um, a law practice because childcare is so expensive, one of them has to leave, the husband or the wife or the, the, the one of the two partners, and invariably it's the mother. And so childcare is so expensive, so non-affordable, that we lose all these brilliant young minds because um, they have to look after the children. And of course, you know, having children is a biological uh, necessity. So uh, the, this whole business about paying for childcare is a huge barrier. No matter how much you declare equality in constitutions and laws, until we really sort out issues of maternity leave, paternity leave, and childcare, and stereotyping, we're not really going to be able to create a level playing field for women lawyers, um, certainly not, not just in the legal profession, but also in other professions like diplomacy, uh, where uh, these are hurdles. So I think uh, really looking at the legal profession, looking at all employment places, and doing a really thorough audit on the basis of what is this like for a woman, whether she's a single mother or she's a, a, a mother with, with, a, with a husband or a partner, but she's going to have to look after the child. And then, of course, in many developing countries, the responsibility for looking after aged parents is with the daughter-in-law of the family. And nobody really cares whether you're a lawyer or not. That's your cultural responsibility. And that creates a huge barrier. So I think really audits of systems to see how these practices translate into the lives of, of women is something that is overdue in many developing countries, certainly, certainly overdue in a country like mine. Um, and often people don't ask beyond the question of, does the law declare equality? Um, and often, of course, it does, and very good, but not in practice. I think that's a real hurdle. I would also say that um, national gender policies, uh, where they actually look through all the functions of government, including partnerships with the private sector in relation to trade, I think this is very important. A national gender policy, if it's effectively implemented, can really look at every aspect of life in a country and look at it from the, from the point of view of a woman uh, who is trying to make her way through society, through employment, uh, through looking after children, through criminal, uh, criminal offenses, through access to the court, through domestic violence, through sexual harassment, and really asking uh, how we can improve access to all of those things. And I do want to say that I was really pleased that the report drew a very, very clear line between violence against women and, uh, and ability to, to survive employment because uh, both domestic violence and other forms of violence against women, and sexual harassment also, all have the effect of creating real barriers uh, for women in the workplace. I really don't know how many times in the course of my uh, employment, a woman has come to work with a black eye and she insists that she fell down the stairs or something. She's not going to report it. She's not going to tell anyone about it. But of course, uh, that is exactly what's happened. Uh, she is the victim of, of domestic violence and the cultural pressure on her not to say anything is huge. And yet it takes away from her the ability to effectively work in this workplace. It means that she's away often and eventually she also is defeated by this violence and she doesn't come to work at all. So I think this is, uh, you know, identifying these barriers as being um, barriers that actually stop women from uh, uh, discovering their, their proper potential in the workplace. I think we need to identify them more 
and countries should really work on doing an audit on how they, they work, how they translate, which is why I say the report uh, is so important. And then the destruction of gender stereotypes. Just three days ago, I took uh, the delegation uh, uh, which was here from Fiji to the, uh, to the Human Rights Council to visit one of the prisons in Geneva. And in Fiji, the majority of prison officers are male. And certainly in the male prisons, they are all male. And we were met by a strapping, swift, wonderful prison warden. She was in charge of the male prison. And I shook her hand so hard, I think she thought I was some kind of demented uh, ambassador. But you see, our Commission of Corrections was on, at my side. And in that one moment of meeting her and talking to her, a thousand fences fell in Fiji. So destruction of gender stereotypes in this area of criminal justice, so important. More women on the bench, more women corrections officers, more women police officers, and you know, not women making tea. If you walk into a police station, you shouldn't find them making tea in the kitchen. They should be in CID, because what we've done, of course, with the justice system is we've identified these professions as having male characteristics. So we start thinking the only people who are going to make good police officers are men. But it's because we haven't defined policing in the way that modern policing needs to be. And certainly you don't need to be six foot five with huge muscles to be a good police officer. You just need to have a brain which doesn't have actually uh, a gender um, a characteristic to it. And I do, so I do want to then say political and judicial leadership. Chief justices who talk about the need for the courts to really provide proper access to justice equally and also disaggregated data. So we see that, in fact, policies of government intended to create equality have worked or not worked, as the case may be. So um, I think, really, it's multifaceted, but the legal profession is very famous, infamous, for keeping women out. It's time for that to change. So happy to learn that Switzerland, at least on some point, takes a bit of advantage over other countries if it comes to gender. So, Ms. Durand, Based on your wealth of experience at the senior level in both policies and development, how do you evaluate policies that allow women to take on more senior positions in society? But first, uh, I would like to, to, to insist on what you explained about the barriers, because of course, what you, all what you explained, I fully agree with those barriers, which are so huge and so difficult to change, stereotype and all the things. And I would, uh, I would add to what you said about violence against women, it's also the question of burden. The burden of women globally, and especially in the developing, in the developing countries, it's not only the domestic task, it's all the tasks are in the hand of women. And how could you, without a, a huge task against stereotype, stimulate women to do more than that? Sometimes in, in a lot of developing countries, the women are only sleeping maybe four or five hours per night. How could you, with, you, you are responsible for domestic things, for water, for, for uh, maybe agriculture, and uh, you, you have to develop, an, an, a, a, I don't know, a SME or I don't know which entrepreneurship. So I think that the burden of, on the woman is so huge that in the developing countries, we have to take into account with the specific situation. Secondly, I think that uh, uh, on the, the, um, the capacity to develop better place for women in, in, in all the places where economic things are discussed, I think that we have also to work on to integrate the question of digitalization. Digitalization will change the world completely, also in the developing countries. And it's why it's so important today to give to the woman the possibility, even in developing countries, to use e-trade, e-commerce as a tool to be autonomous, to bypass the natural or the, the usual network uh, only dominated by male people or by male network. So I think that the digitalization is a huge challenge for women because they could be completely left uh, beyond if we are not aware on that. Uh, capacity building, a capacity to understand and to be involved not only in the using of technology, but create technology, new technology. Women are not dedicated to stay uh, on the backstage. They could become creative people, of course they can. But to do that, uh, we have also to change stereotype and, and capacity for women to, to be part of it. And the last thing is, of course, the question of uh, 
gender balance in all the places where women are there. And I would like to use one example because um, uh, uh, Mr. Chong about Parliament. I was in previous life uh, advised for UNDP uh, in order to train and to help uh, elected women on local level in Algeria uh, to, to do their job because uh, a law was adopted regarding a, a, a quota, okay, a third of women were elected in all the local uh, pa pa assembly, but never uh, uh, training, or they didn't know anything about what they have to do. So training is important, but after that, and in addition to, tr to, to training, it's really how men are reacting on that. In Algeria, all the men uh, uh, elected on the local level organized the meetings in a cafe. Uh, later, between five and seven o'clock, in a, in the beginning of the in a cafe, it's impossible for a woman to go in a in a cafe in Algeria. It's like that. I don't like that, but it's like that. So, uh, all the decisions are taken outside of the place where they have to be taken. It means that all the decisions are taken, and, and, and in Europe, it's in the in the stadium of football, or maybe in the golf, or I don't know where, in some circles where men are discussing between them and are taken. It's the same in the economic world. Sometimes it's not in the place where officially the decision has are, have to be taken, but it's outside of those, those places, and women are not well allowed or accepted or are not used to 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 be part of those activity in the stadium, in the golf, or in the cafe. And I think that all this informal place where the decisions are taken or are prepared, it gives you an advantage because when you are dis discussing the decision, men have prepared the decision before in places where women are not accepted or not allowed to participate. So I think that that's more informal, but we have to take into account that some important decisions, economically, uh, politically, are taken not, or are prepared, not in the place where they are officially taken. And it's important to look at that because uh, it's a way to exclude uh, uh, the preparation of the decision uh, before, before the official uh, place where they are taken. So the last thing that I would like to have, uh, uh, add is a question of macroeconomic things. You know that UNCTAD is working on trade and development, but also about all the macroeconomic things. Oh, how that, or all those things are impacted women. That's also important to look at that. How austerity, austerity measure, are uh, uh, have an effect on women, especially on women. That's not a question of uh, moral judgment on austerity. It's only a question how those policies regarding debt and uh, management of the debt could affect women uh, in their daily life regarding the austerity measure that you can add to a country. That's also something that we would like to, to work on. Uh, and the last thing is that in the WTO in Buenos Aires, it, it was said uh, we have a, a group uh, or, uh, which uh, have to work on gender. I think that uh, UNCTAD will help uh, uh, because we need, so you said, disaggregated data. Without data, how could you evaluate a situation without data and especially disaggregated data? But how could you disaggregate data which are not aggregated? <laughs> I mean, we, when you don't have uh, statistics uh, on women and men, how could you make uh, statistics on that? So we have to work also to train the countries and to trade uh, administration the countries to organize the architecture of the data, data collection. Because otherwise, on long term, you will never have enough data in order to have a judgment on the evolution of uh, economic aspect, in economic involvement of, of women in which sector uh, and which, which uh, 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 incentive uh, were useful in order to increase the number of women working, uh, I don't know, in which sector. So on all those things, we try to, to, to work because we are, as Junta, really dedicated to trade for development. So it's really related one to the other. Okay, thank you very much. So the final question is for Caitlin. So I would like to go back for a moment to presence at the workforce. Uh, so how can women's economic participation and their present in the presence in the workforce actually be strengthened? Well, I think everybody's kind of hinted at it. It's I think it's the care economy. Until we figure out how to deal with this the, the sort of the cycle of life from birth to death, because women are disproportionately, a, obviously the only people at the moment, technologically giving birth, but also disproportionately taking care of aging parents. 
So they have a whole care continuum. There's a life cycle, um, and that until we change, we liberate men to be able to be the caring people that I believe that they want to be and have some of the fabulous, no, but seriously, some of the fabulous interactions that you're able to have with children or with parents and to have time to go away and that we share some of the joy as well as some of the burden because nobody likes to do laundry or at least I don't, maybe some people do. Um, but that until we start sharing this, the, 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 the economic life cycle isn't gonna change at all. And that how you do that in a legislative way is to make sure that you have parental family leave. And there's, again, I go back to the report um, and this incredible table that you have in there, um, Tanya, that's about how different countries legislate and who, where the uptake is and where it isn't in terms of the parental part of it. And there's a lot of use it or lose it um, for the second parent, usually the, the, the non-birth parent. Um, and uh, But you get extra months. In a lot of the economies where this is really working well, you get extra, you're incentivized if the second parent takes some time. And what I've seen here since moving to Europe, I've been here for a while, but th that, that the men who have had this parental leave experience are like, it's a human right, I would never give this up. And the way that they interact with the family environment or their child environment really is is profoundly changed. So I think the legislation helps impact culture, helps impact some of the changes in that way. But that's, it. But that's really an economic thing because we know very well that women stepping out of the workforce, childcare being so expensive, to a two, if, if you're lucky enough to be in a two-person um, nuclear environment, one person has to step out to pay for childcare. Um, that affects then pensions, it affects taxation. We do need to look at how taxation works um, in a fair way with a gender lens, um, which I think will change things uh, greatly. And uh, so yeah, so it's about parental leave for me and how we can help, you know, help men. I think it's also about uh, being liberated from the sort of the toxic masculinities. The New York Times just did a very interesting Investi guess, investigation of uh, middle schoolers in the United States. And they said that, you know, girls can, in the US, or at least in this series of middle schools that they investigated, girls can be anything. And they felt empowered to be anything, but boys could only be one way. And that was tough, and not to have feelings, and to be strong, and just to sort of make it work. And that's a straitjacket. So I think when we talk about gender, we have to look at the entire gendered experience so that we can let people express themselves in a way that really lets them articulate their feelings and, and, and gives them strength. And I think that that'll bring an equality in a, in a good way. So there you go. So thank you very much, all of you, for this uh, extremely inspiring discussion. So I think we've mainly learned that there are a lot of challenges. So step one is to put the right legislation in place, be that quotas, legislation that addresses the difference in the needs of men and women, parental leave, as we just heard at the end, but also regulations that give men and women equal rights to basic services, starting with, for example, financial inclusion, or just simply opening a bank account and so on. But then even once the legislation is in place, we actually face the next issue, which is how to enforce it mainly without it uh, being harmless to women, because one thing we heard is that maybe we give women work, but then it can lead to domestic violence. So it may take a long time to implement the policies, to create the necessary awareness, the right attitudes, and the stereotypes to actually get, get over those. But then at the same time, even though that there is a lot to be done, we also heard that there is already a lot of good practice in place from which we hopefully can uh, actually learn. So. This is a very short summary of a very long discussion. Um, I'm very happy now to open the floor for a Q&A, and I already see lots of hands raising, actually. So <laughs> I propose that we take, we take three questions, and then we can have a next round. Um, maybe start at the back as you're walking to the first.
It's on top. Hi, uh, my name is Leticia Johnson and I'm working for the International Trade Center for um, Women in Trade with the She Trades um, Initiative. This is empowering women entrepreneurs to internationalize their products and services and also help with capacity building. And I'm very happy with the panel because I think you've touched on really great points, so I want to commend you for that. And I also think that it's important for us as individuals to also point this out because it's on us as well. Um, because there's a, a photo of a, a friend who's in business and it was just men and one woman. And uh, I comment on that because I'm gender conscious and I think we should all be. And I was like, it was sarcastic, uh, sarcastic and I was just like, wow, talk about gender parity, right? And he said, oh, we're working on it. After a few months, I saw three more women. And I was like, okay, there's improvement. So although we have to look at the law and institutions and all of that, I think it's also on us to also point it out. Because if we point it out, then it also raises an awareness and puts pressure on them as well. And it stimulates them to think about the environment or the, you know, what, where they are in regards to gender parity. So um, I just wanted to comment on that and I'm really happy with this discussion. Thank you. Well, it's great panel. Thank you so much both to the, the bank group for giving us the report to comment on and for the wonderful panelists. I'm Jane Hodges. I'm an international gender consultant for an Australian initiative called Investing in Women for and I'd like to make a, a question to all of you, and particularly the other diplomatic representation I see in the room. Do you realise that there is no international labour standard banning gender-based violence at work or in the world of work? And the ILO has been working on this. It was a discussion of, of a first type this June, and hopefully it will lead to a binding treaty next June. Do the panellists know about it? Would perhaps the ambassador like to give a, an opinion um, uh, where do we stand on that? And I hope every other diplomat in the room is aware that it's up to Hi. Uh oh. okay. um, hi, my name is Constantina Sanayu. I'm just a law student. Um, and my question to all of you is, um, we see nowadays, especially in continental Europe as well as the United States, that we have kind of a stagnation of feminist views where people say, we don't need it anymore. You have your rights. Like, what do you want more than that? Um, and they do not take into consideration stereotypes that like you mentioned or microaggressions. Why do you believe that stagnation has happened and how can we move past that? I propose we take first this question. <laughs> I take instructions. <laughs> so um, you're probably aware that uh, the treaty, the negotiations, um, and the meetings around the subject of gender equality in the world of work, um, I would say that the discussions were anguished. Uh, would that be a fair description? And uh, there was no real consensus on a number of important issues, but I think it's work in progress, as with all negotiations. I think you just have to keep on at it, um, and there are a number of really uh, good champions, uh, ambassadors uh, in Geneva, uh, and, um, and I think that, um, you know, sense, good sense will prevail. I think there is a consensus around gender equality generally, the difficulty, as I said earlier, is how does it translate into employment practices, and that's not so easily answered as a consensus around the world. That's the problem. Uh, I mean, I, th I think Australia actually, I saw on the scorecard that Australia had done very, very well on, on most issues, 
um, but not every country in the world does as well. And so I think it's work in progress, and I think a lot of the negotiations process includes the sharing of views. I do think ultimately good, good sense will prevail. So I think that's uh, my most hopeful uh, take on the negotiations at the ILC. Um, I was very interested to hear that you think that you're just a law student because in my experience, um, the lawyers actually have the capacity to, to change. And I see the law as an instrument for social change. I don't see it as an income and I know that you don't either. Um, I can see that you also see that uh, as something that could potentially change the way the world sees women. Um, and I think that one of the most positive things about uh, the law is that in fact access to justice has really dramatically improved in many developing countries. So we now have, for instance, domestic violence restraining order regimes where perhaps 10 years ago we didn't. Uh, legal aid commissions are growing and growing, so lawyers are doing more pro bono work, and legal aid commissions are actually providing uh, permanent uh, staff to represent those who can't afford lawyers. I think that case management systems uh, run by judiciaries have become more simplified, and they are designed to improve access to justice. But you know, you can't do any of that without a committed bar. And much of the human rights jurisprudence from the bar table has unfolded because of this passion with the bar. So I should congratulate you. You're at the threshold of being able to forge social change. And I really hope that every lawyer should remember that providing access to justice is the primary role for a lawyer and that they never forget it. Um. Maybe I can add, I, I fully agree with that, and, and the, the bar is very important in order to, well, to change the, the, the mindset and to change the, not only the laws, but the representation of the society. Uh, but remember uh, what happened with the Me Too. So you were doing all this debate on Me Too and, and violence against women. Um, it's also very important that women could uh, speak about that, could claim, not only claim in the justice, but also uh, feel comfortable, comfortable, it's not a good word, but uh, be able to speak about the violence that they, that they, that they had to, 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 to address. And I think that on that, the Me Too uh, discussion on the social media was very important in order to influence a little bit the perception. Of course, how do you define uh, sexual harassment? Well, the debate is very complicated because for some of uh, women of men it's only uh, uh, to, to put the hand uh, for order it's uh, well it could be very diff difficult to define it but the fact that the women are daring to, to speak about that and to speak publicly to explain their experience is so important to influence the bar to influence the parliament to influence the institution and then maybe to influence other women in the society to feel uh, able to speak about that and to, to be a bit, a bit more vocal because the domestic violence, so you explained, it's so important to have access to justice, but before to have access to justice, you have to have access to yourself. <laughs> uh, be, be feel comfortable or enough uh, confident uh, that you can explain your situation and the violence that you, that you have to address in your daily life. And I think that is, that's a complement of what you explained. I fully agree that we need uh, young or lower, convinced that uh, uh, something has to be done, but we have also needs uh, people and women able to 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 be more vocal about uh, uh, the, the, their own situation. Otherwise, it's the balance between the two. Thank you. So I think we can take another set of questions. Thank you um, for that uh, gender discrimination. Uh, I'm um, Henning Enval at the Swedish mission here in Geneva, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the World Bank and the uh, panel for this excellent uh, presentation and, and discussion. Could I uh, ask you, um, um, uh, uh, could I ask you, Tanya Primiani, uh, for uh, your, uh, your take on this um, relevance to trade um, that's been been, been up in the discussion. Um, Kathleen Kraft Buchmann mentioned it uh, that what we do in the WTO, which is part of my portfolio here, um, where 
two years ago, actually, in two, the 2016 report from the World Bank was presented in the WTO, and, and I thought that was really inspiring at the time, and I, I think it has affected the discussion uh, in the WTO. I mean, then m most of the issues that you discuss here, um, social welfare and violence and, and so on, is not something that we could deal with the WTO, but the, some of the concrete barriers in, in uh, on setting up a business and doing business there, maybe uh, things can be tweaked a little bit. So I was wondering, uh, Tanya, if you could give uh, give your favorite example from this year's report on on something, um, uh, because I mean discussions are one with examples. <laughs> and, well, can you give me your favorite example in the trade sphere um, of 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 some barriers that really stand out to you? Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Prugel. I'm the director of the Gender Center here at the Graduate Institute. Also, thank you very much for the report. It's one of my favorite things uh, that comes out of the World Bank. So I'm very pleased uh, that we were able to co-host this. I'm um, sometimes wondering in, in Geneva when we have discussions of the sorts, we are uh, we, we tend to be very uh, optimistic. We uh, talk about progress and we believe in the law and uh, uh, we ca make caveats about uh, stereotypes and implementation and all of those things, and I see that here um, as well. But uh, I, I also sense that we're, we're living in very unusual times when it comes to gender issues. We're li living in times uh, where misogyny asserts itself at the highest level in, in governments. Uh, we have leaders that uh, c commit sexual assault, that uh, disrespect women, uh, they pay off uh, prostitutes so they don't speak, uh, and yet people vote for those people. Um, we have uh, uh, vast attacks on gender studies. Uh, the, uh, the Hungarian uh, government uh, just sought to uh, ban gender studies in Hungary. This is on hold right now. We have movements such as the invol involuntarily celibate, the incels, some of the, you may know about this. So there's a massive actually counterattack on gender equality. And even though we think that there is a strong consensus around gender equality, we also have in uh, Brazil witch burnings when uh, Judith Butt Butler uh, uh, the famous gender theorist visited there. So it seems to me that there's a huge backlash happening. And I have two questions with regard to that. I would like to, Tanya, I'm wondering, uh, in uh, this um, uh, progress uh, that I think you're charting over time, do you also see um, uh, reactions? Uh, do you see steps backs, backwards? Um, uh, do these various fundamentalisms have an impact? And the second question I have is, uh, uh, do we have to change our business of doing business around these issues uh, in Geneva to anybody who cares to respond to that? Hi, thank you so much for this amazing panel. and. Um, as it happens to be, I used to be a student here, and now, and now I work in the UN, and I'm also uh, an economist and a lawyer, so I really like the fact of the title, the second part of it, of business and the law, because I believe every economist should study law to actually do something in the world, and every lawyer should study some economics so that to actually do something in the world. But then, it can't, I can't help but think that maybe women should study what men do and uh, men should study what women do. So is there, it actually rings a bell to what Professor Prugel just said and also what Caitlin was uh, hinting to. Maybe we should actually uh, target more work with men to actually make women, um, like not only target women as to understand what they can do, by showing the example of men, but also targeting men to explaining to them what women can actually achieve. So maybe the, the end men 
part missing in this report to actually make it more gender friendly, truly gender friendly. And then because we don't work with uh, lawyers or economists more so, we work with political, uh, with policymakers. And I keep uh, encountering that uh, fact that policymakers in developing countries, they are willing to commit to gender equality, but they don't know how, as the issue that was raised a number of times uh, here today. And then um, uh, Secret uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, raised that issue on e-commerce. So e-commerce regulation doesn't exist yet. And it has the potential to actually decrease the gender gap. But what do we do so that not to make sh so that not to have the same negative space as we got in trade? How do we tackle the regulation which doesn't exist yet that it actually helps correct the situation on gender equality? Sorry, it's a very broad question, but um, thank you. Sorry, so I'll, um, I'll start by tackling the first two questions. Thank you so much for those excellent questions. Um, Henning, I'm, did I get your name? So I was thinking about your question, and I was trying to, to, to see how, how to make that link, because I completely agree with uh, Isabel. I think that it's a very strong connection. It's a very important one. And what, what I came out with was there are really two aspects that have actually been discussed, but that are really, really critical when you try to make the connection to trade. One is um, basically trying to get women to become entrepreneurs and to become traders. And in order to do that, they need to have access to land. And so I think that's one of the critical elements of the, the reports that that is being tackled in terms, in terms of um, being able to leverage that to become financially sustainable to access credit. So all those elements are really, really key. And so that's kind of almost the, the, the basic things. A lot of the other hurdles, you know, the difficulties in getting an ID or a passport, those, those are things that can be overcome. They just make the, the job more difficult. But if you don't have basic access to land, it becomes very, very difficult to, um, to actually get the financial backing that you would need in order to become an entrepreneur and, uh, and trade. That's the first thing. And I think the second element is one that we've already discussed a lot, so I won't dwell on that. But I think it really has to do with the care economy and allowing women to have access to both leave uh, provisions but also uh, child care for their children so that they have that flexibility to uh, to be able to become entrepreneurs. And I think one element that will um, be helpful to all that, which is also something that was mentioned, is this development of the digital economy and allowing women to do a lot more of this work from home, home-based work, and, and through the internet. And we're seeing a lot of that actually uh, developing really, really quickly in Sub-Saharan Africa, allowing women to trade goods you know, by selling on these platforms and um, doing a lot more than they were able to do uh, years ago because now they have access to um, to this huge you know, consumer base. So. That's my quick answer, uh, answer to your question. The second question on, on reforms and whether any countries are, are moving backwards is a really interesting one. So yes, obviously the trend is for countries to move in, in the positive direction and we, we captured 87 reforms. I don't have the exact number, but we do capture a number of negative reform. It's very low and they tend to be um, fairly insignificant. So for the most part, countries are moving in the right direction. We do capture things like um, countries removing access to um, small courts, which we consider to be good for women because access to small courts means that they can resolve matters faster and things like that. So it's, it's one of the laws, for example, that's technically gender neutral, but that may have an impact, a disproportionate impact on women. So when countries do away with a law on, on small claims court, we consider that to be negative for women. But in general, what we see is trends going in the right direction and con countries have a very positive um, you know, trend towards reform. What we do also see sometimes is that these positive reforms sometimes have unintended consequences. So even though the law itself is going, 
is going in the right direction. For example, in India, they just increased the, the length of maternity leave, which obviously is great. What we found is that um, the, the knee-jerk reaction to that within firms has been to hire less women because the, the burden is placed on the employer. They're the ones who are paying for maternity leave. And as a result, we see that you really have to look at these laws kind of holistically, and it can't just be the one thing. You can't just say, we're going to add maternity leave. It has to be done in conjunction with more social protections and, and things like that. Um, and I, I'd be happy to tell you more, actually. If I have access to my uh, phone, I can actually list exactly which countries have reformed in the wrong way. Um, first of all, on the, I, I would like to continue what you said and then to come to the backlash. Uh, um, on uh, e-commerce and what you ask about regulation, uh, absence of regulation until now, and I'm not sure that uh, in short term we will have uh, regulation because there is no will uh, or possibility in the WTO to have an agreement on a common regulation on e-trade. E uh, but uh, at, in UNCTAD, we try to develop uh, tools, uh, what we call E-Trade for All. That's a network with a lot of people, entrepreneurs, but also uh, uh, company CEO and others, in order to develop the, the best practices, the experience regarding E-Trade. And in one aspect, one aspect of this job is really to look how gender aspect could be better addressed through uh, e-trade. Because e-trade or e-commerce, it's not only uh, working from home, it's also uh, direct contact with your clients. You bypass all the usual uh, network, and that's very important for women, especially in rural areas or even in the cities, but women are, some, are so often uh, excluded of those networks that it's important that they could have access direct to their clients. So it means, of course, that they need uh, training to do that, to be able to do that. And so I said, not only to, be, to use the technology, but to become also creative or, or quick, uh, a new, new part of the, 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 the uh, uh, artificial intelligence printing, 3 day printing, it will change completely uh, the, the way to, to, to produce in the next period. When you could produce with your 3-day print uh, in your house, it would change completely your way to, to, to work. So on all those issues, we try really, as UNCTAD, to prepare maybe later a decision on regulation on that. And UNCTAD is probably the best place for countries, for entrepreneurs, CIO, and others to work on it. And we will start new, new, a new e-commerce week in Africa, not only in Geneva, that's good in Geneva, but we will, we will decentralize it in the countries in order to work with interlocutors on the ground uh, on this uh, specific issue with always an aspect to gender. But, well, we have also to be creative ourselves because uh, it's a new uh, field and it's a field that's not well known and which uh, uh, change uh, in a so rapid way that we have always to adapt ourselves to this uh, evolution. Um, on the backlash that you explained, I, I, I agree uh, that uh, we are not in a very good period. I remember, I'm also uh, uh, not old, but well, not so young. <laughs> so I remember my feminist past uh, and the situation today, 40 years after, uh, it's not solved. The problem are not solved. And sometimes uh, it's more difficult today on some issue uh, to defend uh, new ideas. So we explain with uh, some government or some place in the world where uh, uh, we are really... Uh, um, in a very difficult situation. And I would add to your question and also to the question of, I don't remember who, maybe we have also to work uh, with, not only with, but on men. Uh, I discussed today with our new director, uh, uh, which is from, uh, who is from, from Barbade and Jamaica. And when you look at the, the, the men, and especially the young men, the young black men in some countries, they are completely excluded uh, well, on, on all perspectives. And when you have a society where a part of the, the, the men are completely excluded of the uh, economic or social or, or, or personal perspective, uh, you, the, the other things are developing for criminalities, etc. And it, it, it doesn't help to change the mind of the men. So I think that sometimes look at gender, not only with rights for women, but also what happened with men in some part of the world, what happened and how could we develop a, a better approach of 
men, it's, uh, it's a demonstration that gender, it's not only a question of woman, it's a question of gender, and probably with something to do uh, with not only education, that's the basic level, uh, we say that for a long time, education, but also look how we could work with men uh, feeling a little bit excluded uh, of the um, perspective. And I think that a lot of young men uh, could feel excluded. That's also something that we have to include in the debate and in the backlash that we feel for women, because they are the backlash for women, but also problems for men. And we have probably to try to, to address both. Great. I, I would just say, hi. Is it working? So I just want to say a couple of things. When you talk about um, our friend from the Swedish mission, you know, that, that the WTO is not the place where we can talk about basically economic and social rights, I just want to say that sort of the next event that Women at the Table is putting on is at the WTO Public Forum on aligning gender rights and trade and how these are really two agendas that have diverged since the formation of the GATT and the formation uh, and the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but they really are one, and they need to come together if we're going to survive these tumultuous times and the attack on our liberal um, institutions. Jos Vierbeek of the World Bank Group will be there putting this case forward, as will the Canadian ambassador to the WTO, um, Ambassador De Boer, but also two CEDAW experts and also the really fabulous Kate Gilmore will be making the case for the human rights case. So we think we'd like to be bringing all those things together and start talking about in these crazy times, in these tumultuous times, in these times with this backlash and this negativeness, that we can also reconceive who's, what our alliances are, that we can make alliances between eco economists and human rights activists and really bring us back to what the genesis of all these really great institutions were and are. And, um, and to even go even further is to say, like uh, in the words of Colin Kaepernick, for those of you who've seen the uh, Nike ad today, it's just, are you being crazy? It isn't, are you being crazy, but are you being really crazy enough? And we have to be thinking, we have to be thinking crazy enough, and not only saying that we're surrounded by crazies. That's my parting word. <clears throat> I think this is, a, this is a fantastic final note for today. Uh, thank you very much again to the panel for uh, giving your time and your insights. I saw many more questions from the public, but I'm afraid that I do have to close down uh, the event. But maybe you can try to get your hands on some of the women here on, on stage and men. Sorry. <laughs> so have a very nice evening and hope to see you at the next event.